take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 John chapter 1. This morning we've finished the Ten Commandments, and we'll be today just in this for these first four verses of 1 John chapter 1. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. I have to admit to you that when I moved to New Mexico four years ago, looking back, I really didn't understand what a green chili was. <laughs> I thought I did. Kathy had cooked with the little canned green chilies, you know, over the years, but I didn't know what fresh green chili was in a burrito, <laughs> on a cheeseburger, <laughs> smothering anything in its way. There are people getting up, they're leaving, they're going to go order food right now. I mean, canned green chili is green chili. So can you imagine coming to New Mexico and trying to sell people on canned green chili? It is green chili, but there's nothing about it that makes the glands to start salivating and the eyes to widen and a passion that I see in you just talking about green chili <laughs> this morning. And we look at 1 John 1, 1 through 4 this morning, and the title is Canned or Fresh? I'm talking to folks who are online, folks in this room, the majority, maybe not all, but the majority of whom know Christ as Savior. And we've been left on this earth with a mission to get the gospel out. That's, that's you and me, all of us. We, we all have that assignment. And we've got to do it one way or the other. But if that mission comes from the freshness of knowing God deeply, things are different than when it comes from a canned walk with the Lord. Let's look at these verses and what John is saying to us here. The, the aged apostle writes, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be full. Now, John is writing to his readers in part, in a large part, to combat the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, among other things, that Jesus could not have come in the flesh. He, he could only have been a spirit. And so John is writing to say, no, I'm an eyewitness. We are eyewitnesses. Jesus, who was God, came to this earth in a real body. He was born 100% God, 100% man. So that's one of the reasons that John is writing this, but I want us to look through and see what this might mean to me and to you in our walk with the Lord. He says here, what was from the beginning? He's tying it all together right here uh, to start with. They, they know who was from the beginning. He says, he's saying, what I'm about to tell you about, this is God that I'm about to tell you about. And it's the same John that over in the gospel of John says, in the beginning, the Word was with God. And that, that Word there is, is the Logos of God, which we know is Jesus. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he goes on to say a few verses later in verse 14 of John 1, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of, that, as that of the only begotten of the Son of God, full of grace and mercy." So he says, that's the one I'm talking about, the one what was from the beginning, but then he says, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes. Now, both of these are in a verb tense that means it happened, but the effects are still ongoing. 
is what John's talking about. And this is John. This is the one who was there at the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there at the feeding of the 5,000. He was there for healings. He was there for all of it. And he was among those who were willing to give their lives and did give their lives to say, I'm telling you, I saw him. And you say, well, they, you know, they're just saying that because you know, they were there. Well, yeah, you'd say it too if you were there, and you'd give your life as well. So he says, we have heard, but he said, it's still ongoing. We, we heard this Jesus talk in the flesh with real words, with a mouth, and we heard it, but he says, it's just like I can still hear him talking in my ear. What we have heard, and he says the same, again, the same verb tense, what we have seen with our eyes. We saw him, I'm telling you, he stood before me, I saw him, and I can just still see him standing there. What we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, and we think, who to lolly, if we could have heard Jesus talk in that body that he had on this earth, if we could have really just seen him, and yet the scripture says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We have heard him, we have seen him, we have looked at him, and this is not a glance. The, the verb here means to, to stare at. I'm telling you, it wasn't uh, a flash uh, that I wasn't sure about. He stood there, I saw, and we looked on him, we gazed on him, and what we have touched. And the word here means to handle. It doesn't mean the one finger rule. Now, when our children were growing up, we began with the one finger rule. We'd stop somewhere and go into a store. And uh, I, don't even get, I don't even know how many children we actually have. I could, never could count them all, but there was a bunch of them. And we started with the one finger rule. You touch it with one finger, all the other fingers are closed like this. That didn't last very long uh, because boys can do a lot of damage with one finger. And uh, so we went on to the just don't touch it. So this isn't the one finger. This is handling. This is exactly what Jesus said to Thomas there when he met Thomas in Luke 24. He said, see my hands and my feet, and it is myself. Touch, handle me, Thomas. Feel my skin. That's, that's exactly what uh, John is writing about here. John says, we heard him. We saw him. We, we, we touched him with our hands. He was real. We were on a three-year camping trip with this man. I'm telling you, Jesus was with us. Peter would later write in 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not cl follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. <clears throat> In these days, and you see in the Old Testament, and it goes over into the New Testament, it would take two or three witnesses to confirm a matter. And someone beautifully pointed out that that's what John's doing here. He's using the two or three or more witnesses of the various senses to say he was here. Concerning the word of life. And there's, there's so much packed into this little three-word phrase here, the word of life. And if you look in your scripture, it's more than likely the word and the life are capitalized. <clears throat> because again, word there is, is that, that word logos, that was speaking of Jesus, the word who was there in the beginning. And that was Jesus, and he was there, and he was, he was with God, and he was God. The word of life, of eternal life. And the interesting thing is that Jesus is called the word of because everything about Jesus and his gospel involves words. It involves communication. The gospel involves telling someone else about Jesus. You say, well, you know, I, I want to just live it out. Well, that's good, and there's the old phrase that you see pop up, uh, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. That sounds really neat, uh, but it's just, it's just not so. It's like saying, feed the children, and if necessary, use food. Okay, the gospel is words, because otherwise you spend all those years at the workplace, all those years in the neighborhood thinking everybody's going to get saved just because of the way I live. Now, the way we live is important. Don't get me wrong there. You want to live according to what you're saying. Yes, imperfectly, but, but trying. But otherwise we get to the end, and finally that coworker comes up at our retirement day, and they say, I got it. All these years I've been watching you live. You're so different. You're so unique. I finally understand it. You're a vegetarian. 
Our life is important, trust me. But the gospel involves words. We share the gospel. So here's John, <clears throat> and there's just this cascading of these truths. He goes on in verse 2, and the life was manifested. It was shown. It was made clear. And we, and he goes on, you see, this is, the, this, is, this is the gospel. This is the testimony of the Christian. He says, we, it was personally shown to us. We have, and here he goes again, we have seen, same verb form. We testify, same word from which we get our word martyr. We're willing to give our life for it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and again, was manifested, shown. John, in these first three verses, is going to say the same thing several times. And in the Scripture, when you have repetition, it's to make a point. And John is hammering down this point. Now, John is writing again, in large part, to defeat the Gnostic heresy. But what if someone needed proof from me? What if someone needed proof about how real Jesus is from you? What could you give them? Could we give them canned green chili version of how real Jesus is? Or could we give them fresh, real? I'm telling you, no, I wasn't there in the first century. I didn't physically see him with my eyes, but I'm telling you, He's real, as the song says, because he lives in my heart. And let me tell you about him. I've met with him today. See, I love to read the Old Testament. I love to read the New Testament. But I love thinking about how this morning, Sunday, November 14th, in my quiet time, when I was praying this morning, I was praying to the same God that Jacob prayed to. I was praying to the same God who spoke to Moses. I was praying to the same God all through those pages of Scripture. And just as he was alive and doing miracles, then he's alive and doing miracles now. And I spoke to him today. Let me tell you about that. Now, I'm going to tell you, I spoke to him this week a lot because I knew I was preaching this. See, you don't get that benefit. So you should call me and say, preacher, what should I work on this week? Because I want my toes to not be as sore this week. But week in, week out, is it canned or is it fresh? We finished the Ten Commandments And you remember the New Testament, Jesus said you could hang the Ten Commandments on two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Those two halves of the Ten Commandments. And that's what this is getting at. We talked about the heart so many times as we looked at the Ten Commandments. Because as New Testament believers, not living under the law, but living under the grace... But 2 Corinthians, we looked at, told us that if the law was good, life uh, under grace in the Spirit ought to be even better. Not doing so to fulfill an outward law, but from the heart saying, I love you, God. And therefore, I don't want to go that way. I want to follow you and honor you in these ways and live beyond the letter of the law, but from the heart follow you. And that's what John is saying here, that we have known him freshly. We saw him face to face. And we, he says in verse 2, proclaim to you. That's the normal Christian life. That firsthand experiencers of Jesus Christ want to tell others about Jesus Christ. And we talk about evangelism. Every time we talk about evangelism, sharing the gospel, everyone's heart rate goes up. People start turning red because it's scary for most people. But let me tell you, you're not alone. And it's okay. Because the normal Christian life says, I may not be great at this, but I'm determined I'm going to do something to make sure the gospel gets out. I'm real big into starting simple. If you've never done anything with the gospel, start simple. Start with with running up, throwing gospel tracts at a clerk and running the other way before they can even say, I'd like to know more. Just start where you're at and let God grow. Start by praying for your waiter or your waitress, asking them, hey, what can I pray for you? did that a couple times this weekend, and and in both cases, they had something that they really wanted prayer for, a sick sick relative. If they don't, don't make them stand there for 10 minutes. Just let them off the hook. Hey, I caught you off guard. I'll just pray for you. What's your first name? Start somewhere. Start by asking someone. Has anybody ever told you lately how much God loves you? 
and you think, I don't know what I'll say if they say, no, I'd like to hear. Trust me, once you get the first sentence out, if you know enough to come to Christ, you know enough to tell them about how God loves them. You'd be shocked at how God, the Spirit of, of God, will immediately begin to tell you exactly what to say. So he says, we proclaim to you again the eternal life, Jesus, the Word of God, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And what we have seen and what we have heard, there he is again, we proclaim to you also. Again, we see manifested twice, proclaimed twice, and the seeing and the hearing three times to make the point. He's real, he's real, and he's been made clear to us, and so therefore we want to proclaim to you. We've begun our No Place Left training here at Sandia, our No Place Left team. Some of those folks worked the photo booth two weeks ago at our Harvest Festival, and those folks who came over to get their picture taken got a conversation about the gospel. We'll be getting into that more regularly as January rolls around and we'll train you. You go out, I remind you, it's not about door to door as the silver bullet. It's just that our days are so clear. Our weather is so good. Every time we go out, we always come back with somebody that we say, if we hadn't gone out, we wouldn't have met Sue. If we hadn't gone out, we wouldn't have met Joe. And part of the team is to stand there and smile and pray. So you can do it and get on the job training using very, very simple non-intrusive, permission-based gospel. You say, well, I don't want to do that. No problem. Do something else. Won't hurt our feelings. But we've got to be those who proclaim. Set yourself a goal. We've done this before. We've done seven days of sharing. Say, you know what, God, help me this week. I'm going to try for seven days, every day, one person to say something about Jesus, prayer, church, just, just to say something and see where it goes. I've done that before. I've just kept a, a list in my phone because then I could pray for those people. You can do seven days, 14 days, 30 days. We'll do that again as a church sometime. But just start with something, doing something, because this is the normal Christian life that he says. We've seen it. We've heard it. We proclaim to you. And there's a huge, huge Greek grammatical thing that happens here in the middle of verse 3. We have there in our English version, so that. <clears throat> Some so that's in the Scripture just, just mean so that. Uh, but some, like this one, mean so that. He says, okay, I've been telling you all these things, but I'm telling you here, let's get down to the bottom line. The reason I'm telling you all this, and he says here, is so that you too may have fellowship with us. That's the normal Christian life is that we don't want it to stop with us. You see, this thing wasn't meant for us to hold on to, but to spread it far and wide. I believe that's the reason we're here. I mean, otherwise, what, what would the purpose be? I think if this wasn't the reason that when you come down front or you kneel beside your bed or you are there at the coffee shop and you come to know Christ, you'd say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me for my sin. I believe that Jesus was God. I want to know you and live with you forever. Amen. And the person with you, of course, they wouldn't be there either because they'd be gone, but you'd just be gone. There'd be no reason to stay here. But we're here on mission because it's supposed to be passed on. So he's saying, all I'm saying to you guys and again, he's writing to, to mostly believers here, but that's the gospel. Paul says to the Roman church, he says, everywhere I go, I hear about your faith. You, I'm so proud of you, church at Rome. And then later he says, I can't wait to get there and preach the gospel to you. What? Because you see, the gospel is for every day of our life. Yes, it's first and foremost so that we can be born again and come to know Christ so we'll live with him forever. But there's not a day in my life I don't need to be reminded of where I was and what Jesus did to put me on the path that I'm on to this day. So it's supposed to be passed on. So he's essentially saying, y'all come on in. But now the first century believers, the pattern of y'all come on in was they went out and they found the people to say, y'all come on in. In fact, many believe that the first century house church didn't have much of a, y'all come be our guest. There were no greeters at the door of those house churches passing out bulletins, you know, saying, come on in, I hope you find a comfortable seat. The evangelism was really done mostly outside those, the walls of those house churches. And that's still the case. There's nothing at all wrong, and it's good for us to invite people to come here because they can hear the gospel. We want to do that. 
but we don't want that to be all. We got to go out. We like to draw a circle around us and say, y'all come on in. God, I believe, likes to circle around the city and the state and the world and say to the church, y'all go on out so that then we can say, y'all come on in. When we were in Japan for 10 years, people are by and large scared of Caucasians, especially Caucasian men. They've watched the movies. They assume that you're going to pull out, you know, a submachine gun and blow everybody up, you know, and, and all that. And, and largely they're afraid because you might speak English to them and then they'll be on the spot. Very, very sweet, gracious people, but very shy. So they're, they're really big into the natural springs. And so if you're with a group of Americans, and you want to go, and, and they're, they're the, the tubs, the outdoor tubs seem to be all full. You just send one or two Americans to sit in a tub that has Japanese men in it, if you're, or Japanese ladies, if you're a lady, and pretty soon they'll all leave, and you'll have the tub to yourself. Um, that's not come on in. Again, it wasn't because they were rude. They were just scared of us. But the natural Christian life says, I'm still here because there are people that need to come in to experience this Jesus that I know like this. I've seen him, I've heard him, I've touched him. And for us, it's not physical, but it's communing with him over his word and in prayer and experiencing him as we attempt to obey him and learn more and more about him. That they may know you, the true God, and Jesus whom you've sent. That is what the Lord wants for us to experience that you too may have fellowship with us. And I love this. He says, where's the fellowship that we want you to come experience? The fellowship we're having, he says, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son. And he doesn't say here, but it's through the Spirit. The whole Trinity is there. He's going to go on. We're not going to look at this this morning. He's going to go on and say that, that if we're believers, we ought to be seeking, growing, and walking in the light, and that's the best place for believers to gather. Where are we going to meet? Well, we could meet here. We could meet there. We could meet there. And he says, but as believers, the place for us to meet is walking as in, in, in the light by God's grace imperfectly, and that's where the fellowship is. You imagine trying to get two Americans to agree on anything? Imagine if we said, all right, we're going to all order some pizza that have to be the same topping. I mean, we would split the church right down the middle. The church would never be the same again. We can't agree on anything, but he says there's one thing that if we really want to find a place to meet, it's at Jesus, fellowshipping there. And I'm fellowshipping there if it's fresh, if I'm walking with him, if daily I'm seeking him through his word, daily I'm seeking him in prayer. And I'm trying to then live out what I'm learning in his word, stumbling, but stumbling the right direction. And so he says, we go out and we tell them about a very real, fresh God, and we invite them in to the very same place where we are. And then in verse 4, he says, these things we write, and there's that exact same so that. Why am I writing you? And he's going to go on with an entire letter after this. Why do we write these things to you so that? Our joy may be full. Whether we're writing, tweeting, texting, posting, calling, sending a postcard, verbally sharing, he says, that's where the joy is at at its fullest. Because as believers, you're going to be frustrated. I'm frustrated when I'm not attempting to share the gospel, when I'm not attempting to make that a part of my life. And the best way to make that a part of my life and to experience the fullness of it is to know Jesus this way. You, you share about him not knowing him freshly. You can go out and give the green chili version of the gospel, the canned green chili version of the gospel. It's still the gospel. People get saved. But it's going to be a lot more joyful for you, for me, if it's this way, where I know him so much that I'm like the disciples, that you know him so deeply you're like the disciples, where you say, you know what? We just can't stop speaking of what we have seen and what we have heard. And that's what John says to us here. George Whitfield said, we can preach the gospel of Christ no further than we have experienced the power of it in our own hearts. And I'd say we've got to, we've got to one way or the other, but it's going to be a lot better if we do it from a heart that has heard him and seen him and handled him and know him like this. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want to just ask you to pause, 
<clears throat> I want to ask before we go anywhere, those online, those here in the room, I want us to just spend a little time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed today, just doing business, just, just talking to God. He knows where I'm at. He knows where you're at. And that you'd just be able to say, God, I want to know you deeply. I want to know you daily and in a fresh way like this, God. And, and perhaps by his spirit, he'll reveal something to you that needs to change. Maybe you're a believer and you really aren't in the Word every day. You, you just can't. You, you just can't have the fullness of the Christian walk. You can't experience Him the way He's died on the cross, come down from heaven, intervene in history, unless you're in His Word regularly. You miss a day, you get back up the next day. And God would say, you're going to have to do something to attach that Bible reading, that Bible study to something to make sure it happens in your life. And maybe God would say to you, you know what, you, you don't pray to me. Maybe you pray over a meal. Maybe you pray on the way out the door. But you don't carve out any time to really sit with me and talk. And God would say, you're going to have to find a way to attach that to something so that you're, you're communing with me in prayer. And there are other ways that God may say, you, you know, you're doing some of these things, but you're, you're also, this is a part of your life that's a major roadblock. You're, you're undoing everything you're getting in, in your quiet time because of a lifestyle issue that you're not willing to even talk to me about. I don't, I don't know, but God does. And it may be that here in a moment when we stand to sing that you just want to come and, and come to this the altar, these steps down here and, and just do some business with God. Just pray here where you're at. Some would say, you know what? I don't even know this God. I believe he exists, but I, I don't know that I'd go to heaven. I, Jesus doesn't live in my heart. And you'd come today and you'd just say, I want to know Jesus for sure. And we'd be glad to share with you how you can know him. Some would say, you need to, I need to follow him in believer's baptism. I need to make this my church home for this time in my life. There's so many ways God may be moving. But in a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And don't wait. Whatever he has said to you, just first note of the first stanza, you just step out and act on what he said for you to do. God, move in those watching online, live or later, those in this room, in my heart, and let this be a time where we respond to you, that we just say yes to whatever you're saying to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing. Don't wait. First note of the first stanza, you do 